So we finally, finally started to get some rain across Lusaka province this week. It started on Sunday night into Monday and every day or so we've been having a little bit of something. Farmers across the southern half of Zambia have been waiting and anticipating for weeks as to when they were going to be able to get out into the field to put down their crops like cereals, legumes, sunflower and the other things that are normally planted at the beginning of the rainy season. There were some farmers out there who went and planted in early November when we had the first, 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 first rains. But unfortunately, after that, it was a dry spell and it has been a very, very hot. We're talking intense heat where we have temperatures ranging from about midday 34 to 39, 40 degrees. And those are conditions that made everything very hard. So over the last couple of weeks, we've started getting our fields ready, but we were doing things with one hand tied behind our backs, as they say. We knew that we couldn't get to serious planting until we had enough moisture in the ground. So we needed the rains to come properly, effectively, as they say. So we're glad we can finally start getting our fields ready for planting, but we're not rushing into the exercise thinking everything's going to be okay. Everything's unky-dory, as they say. And that's because, like most farmers across Southern Africa who depend on rainfall for their field crops, Mondo Farms is facing a very challenging next few months as we start to feel the effects of the current El Nino weather system. So our plans for planting field crops this season can't exactly be the same as they have been in previous years. We're gonna have to change things up quite a bit. On this video, we're going to be talking about the tough weather situation that we face in Southern Africa this season. And we're going to be looking about how we can still try our best to get a good harvest next winter by knowing more and doing things a little bit differently. Stay with us. Greetings from the farm. I hope you're well. It's so good to have you back with us again here on the Mondo Farms channel. And if it's your first time watching one of our videos, welcome aboard. My name is Chisha Folatia and I am at Winterthorn. It's one of the two farms we have just outside of Chongwe. Where I am right now is about 45 kilometers east of Lusaka, the capital city of Zambia. We grow different things on our farms. We first started out by planting commercial timber trees for the long term. And in 2020, we put down our first pine and then eucalyptus the following year as well as casuarina. Our main focus area is on vegetables, which we grow throughout the year under irrigation. Our main crops are fruiting vegetables like eggplant, cucumber, sweet pepper, zucchini. We also sometimes grow rooting vegetables like carrots and onion, as well as green beans as a leguminous rotation crop. Hey, back in the day, we used to grow leafy vegetables like cabbage, but that didn't end well. And every rain season, we grow maize and soya beans on some of our larger fields, taking advantage of the water we normally receive from the heavens. We call these rain-fed field crops. The maize is for consumption by our workers and my family, and the soya beans is a commercial crop that we sell on the local market. When I was growing up in the 1970s, life was really simple. We'd get home from school, we'd go out to play with our friends in the neighborhood around McKinney, just south of Lusaka, and then we'd make sure to be home for 17 hours where we'd have a quick bath, most of the time, and then TV would open at 17 hours after the national anthem and all of that. Then they'd start with some cartoons. There was usually Roger Ramjet, there was Atom Ant, and there was Secret Squirrel, and they play these all the time, all the time, all the time. Then after that, there would be some general interest programs for children. One of the, my favorites was called The Big Blue Marble. And I remember the opening sequence had this shot of the Earth taken from space, as a panning shot of 
you know, the earth looking like a big blue marble. And we used to love the opening sequence, which had a bunch of kids singing, closer, growing closer. I need to remember the other words, but we go closer, something like that. I really loved that program. As a young child growing up in Southern Africa back then, it gave me the first glimpse of what life was like for other children. But when they made such programs, we didn't know as much as we do about how interconnected the whole world is, about how one thing happening on one side of the world can affect people and places on the other side. We didn't know that much about climate science and words that everybody hears these days. Things like the jet stream, ocean currents, atmospheric heat domes, pressure systems, glaciers, and all that. But now we all know a lot more about it, and there are very few people out there who've never heard of the term El Nino, the little baby. For most of this year, we've been hearing reports of an El Nino forming in the Pacific, and it has had us worried about the type of weather that we will have here in Southern Africa. I mean, think about it, the Pacific, Southern Africa, and we are all connected. The initial weather forecasts were a little bit vague, and but we still had a little bit of hope, but now it is pretty much confirmed that the rain season that we're going to have here in Southern Africa this year into next, it's going to be a very difficult one. In fact, it's going to be rubbish. The rains have come, but they've come very late for most parts of Zambia. And even as they have come, they will be intermittent dry spells, which we'll talk about later. And they will also be increased insect infestation. You see, I had to say that really carefully because it's really hard to say, insect infestation. There are parts of Zambia that have already had a very good rain season. We're talking about Wapula, Northwestern, the north up there, things are okay. But for most of us in the west, center, south and east of Zambia, it's going to be very difficult. By the way, I'm mostly talking about Zambia because that's where I am, it's where I live, and it's what I know the most about. I can't get too deep into the situation in neighboring countries, but I can only imagine that for parts of Zimbabwe, for parts of Malawi, maybe Botswana, and parts of the inner interior part of Mozambique, things are going to be pretty similar. A few months ago, I was reading a report by one of the international agencies, I think it's called FuseNet, and they focus on food security challenges and their main topic of that particular report was about the El Nino and how it would affect us here in East and Southern Africa. And the report kept using the F word. Ooh, that's a serious word. No, not the one you're thinking of. Famine. Famine for Africans is something that some of us might remember and something that some of us could actually possibly go through. So that's the international level. Then you get down to national level and the local governments like here in Zambia, they've been giving us warnings and trying to prepare us and make things better for quite some time. Most of that warnings and forecasts are done through the meteorological department, what some might call the Weather Bureau. And they keep changing the name every couple of years, but they've been giving us those reports for some time. And a few weeks ago, the minister responsible for that part of the government came to parliament and made a ministerial statement. They do ministerial statements when things are quite serious. So I'm going to quote from you from what the Minister for Green Energy and Environment said to parliament the Honorable Colin Zinzovu. The rain season is likely to start this month, meaning November, over the northern parts of the northwestern province, Luapula province and northern province. The onset for areas over the southern parts of the country is likely to be by the end of December. Areas over the rest of the country are, are likely to have the onset of rains by the end of November. The rainfall amounts are likely to be normal to below normal in most parts of the country. The rainfall distribution is likely to be erratic and uneven with some periods of 
prolonged dry spells and periods of heavy rainfall events. And the temperature is likely to be above normal in most parts of the country, especially during the day. Funny enough, this is exactly how my farming journey actually started. I remember the rain season we had in 2020 into 21. That year, the rains came so late that we were only able to plant our field crops around Christmas. And our yields in the end, they were not that great. Let me say a quick word or two about negative news and how human beings handle it. There's some people out there for whom any piece of negative bad news, they just can handle it and they're just okay. But for other people, it is not that easy. And who can blame them when almost all the time we're being bombarded by doom and gloom? Personally, I had a really tough time during the COVID-19 pandemic and it really affected my mental health. To this day, I get triggered by seeing somebody wearing a mask. Another thing that triggers me is seeing those t-shirts featuring our former political leaders who did so much damage to our economy that we are having a really tough time as Zambia having to cope with the consequences for it now. Most of us are on WhatsApp groups where people post stories and people love to post bad news stories. I'm on a lot of farming WhatsApp groups, right? And the other day on one of the groups, we saw a story being posted about people having their phones snatched in Kabulonga. Okay, farming, phone snatching in Kabulonga. What? So what are these people saying? That there isn't enough bad news about farming and agriculture? That they also need to add in posts about crime and theft and stuff like that? Uh-uh, farming has built in misery. But some things like that are easy to understand when you look at what scientists like my wife, who is a behavioral scientist, have come up with concepts like the negativity bias. The negativity bias is a serious thing and it's basically all about how the human mind is wired to dwell on the negative. It's wired to look out for danger. What is it out there that could be hurting us? And it goes way back to when humans first became hominids and then first became homo sapiens in East Africa, came down off the trees and things were not good for them. So they were always on the lookout for danger. So up to this day, our minds are wired to look out for negatives. I was watching a video by Wendover Productions. They do a lot of really good videos that explain a lot of different concepts. And it really got me um, helped to understand why things are looking so negative most of the time. And things like that help me to handle my perspective of life, especially as I grow older and more bitter. After all, I've seen it all before, haven't I? So if the things I talk about in this video are hard to hear, then please bear with me. Please don't start writing stinkers in the comments. I don't mean to upset you, but there are serious things we need to talk about, the serious situation that we are in, and I'm working on the assumption that if you are watching this video on the Mondo Farms channel, then you are either a farmer or already involved in agriculture, or you are planning to be a farmer and get involved in agriculture, and that you already know that farming Farming and agriculture is a field that is full of bad news. Farmers are always hearing and being told and finding out things that ugh, they wish they didn't. It could be bad news about their farm, it could be bad news about their crops, maybe something happening to their livestock. It could be negative news about the economy. Things like 25 kwacha to $1. I can't imagine what's going to happen. It could also be negative news about the climate and the weather. And weather affects farmers very directly. Sometimes, as in our case, we're talking about rain-fed crops that need to be irrigated. Sometimes it's also about the aquifers that feed the boreholes on which we irrig irrigate and look after our livestock and our crops and the rest of our farms. 
Weather can sometimes be a problem like last year. In this part of the world, we had too much rain. If you remember, we had a couple of cyclones and I remember one called Freddy and Freddy sat over Malawi and Mozambique, I think it was for quite a while and did a lot of damage. This year, it will be somehow the opposite, where we the forecasts are telling us that we will just not get the amount of rainfall that we need. So that's the situation, and it has got farmers across the areas of Zambia that are affected asking questions and wondering what to do. I saw a question like that on one of our um, WhatsApp groups where one of the farmers said, my farm is just size of Lusaka. I haven't planted my maize yet because the rains haven't started properly. And he was asking about any best advice or what he should do or not. So for farmers like him and perhaps yourself, I'm going to share how Mondo Farms is approaching the field crop issue this rainy season. We'll be talking about the advice that we've been getting from the experts and looking at how we're adapting that to change how and where we grow field crops on our two farms this season. So the first thing that we do is we are learning as much as possible. We are getting in as much as information and considering it. So one of the languages that I come from, because I'm from, made up of many different tribes across Southern Africa, is called Bemba. And the Bembas are the champions of adages, sayings and proverbs. They've got something for every situation, positive and negative. And the Bemba saying that I'll use in this instance says, Ukutangila tekufika. And that translated means something like, the one who starts first doesn't necessarily become the one who finishes first. I know you're going to argue with me, some people in the comments and say, no, that's not what that, pro that proverb means and whatever it is. But no, let's stay focused. The basic concept is that rather than rushing, getting out there and starting to act, 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 take your time to think, to plan and consider the situation as it is. In this particular instance, the forecast that we've been getting from the Meteorological Department, Ministry of Agriculture, and other advice that you're seeing, for example, on this video, are the things that you need to take in. But the forecasts themselves, because they tell us bad news about the El Nino affected weather that we're going to have in the next few months, they may be hard to take. Now, that doesn't stop a lot of people from posting repeatedly the same weather forecasts on so many WhatsApp groups. They don't even stop to check to say, no, uh, this thing is three days old. Has it already been posted on this channel? But again, that's the negativity bias I was talking about. And bad news is good. Bad news is good. You come back to what I said earlier about being able to handle the negativity. Farmers need to read those weather reports, take them in and look carefully at the advice that is being given. So the success of every crop starts in the beginning and it has a lot to do with how you prepare your field. So we're being advised to change the way we prepare our fields this year. When I first heard about no-till growing, I was still very young in farming. I was still learning about lots of other things I needed to understand like, you know, crop nutrition, so your nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. I had to learn about crop rotation, chlorophyll, sucking and chewing pests versus crawling pests and all the different insecticides and pesticides, organics and stuff. There was a lot to learn. So I just couldn't have the bandwidth. I didn't have the bandwidth to take on this, this idea of no-till growing. As far as I knew, farmers always plow the fields before they plant. I mean, that's how it has been since the dawn of civilization, right? But then they come along and they say, no, no, no disturb the ground as little as possible. And now that I'm three and a half years into my farming journey, I'm beginning to understand the benefits of no-till growing, of disturbing the ground as little as possible. 
there's a lot of videos and information out there and government bureaus and agencies that are promoting uh, no-till growing etc so you can go ahead and watch those but the basic idea is that you you do as little as possible to disturb the earth now this is very important in a year like this why because when we have these dry spells the ground gets baked hard and then when the rains come and you get one two three days maybe of very intense rain or the rainstorms that we have these days the ones where you get like three hours of rain falls in 30 minutes and the, the earth just needs to go somewhere and then you get a lot of topsoil that's taken away and a lot of erosion so with no-till growing you have less erosion so as we prepare our fields uh, in the next days or so to plant we are not going to be doing very much plowing especially in the fields that were already plowed last year and the year before and not there's one more advantage about no-till plowing is that when you uh, no-till growing should i say is that when you plow the earth you open up the the ground and then you get a lot more moisture loss during evaporate to due to evaporation so if you think about a time when you've got a dry spell and it's not going to rain for one week or two weeks or so Yo, you want to conserve as much moisture in the ground, feeding your plants as much as possible, especially if it continues to be hot or the focus. So this season, as we prepare the ground, the teams have already started ripping, something called ripping the ground. One thing you notice on these videos though is that we are not using tractors yet. We are doing things manually. Partly because of a reduced amount of fields, as I'll tell you later, and partly because the cost of tractor hire has just become astronomical. After all, we are now at a Christmas to the dollar. So this rain season, we are going to be having periods as they've been forecast of intense rainfall, one, two days of heavy rainfalls, and then intermittent dry spells in between. Now, all of this means that we're going to have more pest problems and disease pressure. I know the bad news just keeps coming, doesn't it? Hey, <laughs> bear with me, as I said. Let's look at the reasons why. Number one, insects. Insects breed and grow more and faster when the temperature is hotter. It's scientifically proven. They've been doing a lot of research and they have found that insects will be much, much, much more. So seasons like this, we will have more pressure in our maze from things like armyworm. Number two, during those periods of intense heat and lack of rainfall and moisture, the crops become stressed. Can you imagine? Crops become stressed. If you've ever gone into a field on a very hot day, you'll see that the plants are just lying like this and they're conserving their energy. It's just incredible. Crops are organisms as well. I don't talk to them yet. Number three reason why we'll have pressure, disease pressure, is because when you have a lot of rainfall for quite some time, the leaves and foliage of our plants become wet and then they don't get a chance to dry out. So normally if you have a normal rain season, you'll have rain, maybe two days, rain, a bit of rain, a bit of rain in the afternoon, morning, rain, evening, the whole night, whatever it is, but there's always that time to dry out. Now, if we don't have that, what we then get is a very moist environment, especially for crops that are planted close together. And that is the ideal condition for fungal diseases to grow and thrive. All the years that I've been planting maize here at Winterthorn and at Kimberley, I've never really had fungal pressure in maize. We've had it in soybeans a little bit and you put down a little bit of like a, you know, like a saf here and there, it's okay. But this year we're really anticipating um, more fungal disease pressure. 
How will we know that we have these problems? One of the most important things that farmers in this situation have to do is increase their scouting. They go out on patrol. So let's say you, you normally have a look at your crops every, every two, three, four days or something. This season, we need to be going out and having a look at our crops all the time to look for these problems and pressures. So let's say we've had a severe dry spell for the last, last week, and we know that, ah, my army worms are and we had some army worm, we sprayed and they could be back. We need to be up there seeing it right before it becomes a more serious problem. You go out there, you see the problem. The other thing that we need to do this season is to up our game in terms of crop protection. Crop protection means the things that we do to look after a crop against the things that want to harm it. So you've got insects, which will be more of this season as we've said, and we've also got diseases, which we will also more likely to have more of. So those have got certain things that we apply to our crops to defeat them, to, to help against them, or whichever way, but those come with problems. In seasons like this, when you've got high insect infestation and high disease pressure, it's important that we be rotating our crops, our, our, our pesticides and fungicides as much as possible, and then also that we get our teams, the people spraying our crops and applying, to spray properly, to mix properly. Everybody just needs to be paying attention to what they're doing. So, I shall say this way one too. Iriabe tati lazy farming, where a guy phones once a week and asks his people at the farm, ma spraying ah? Eh, in the barn at spraying ah? Yeah, that just won't work this season. We all, all of us involved, the people who own the farms, maybe like yourself, and the people who work on the farms, everybody needs to have their game because the situation is quite serious. Quick word on pesticides and fungicides. Sometimes I get comments, um, people really strongly advocating for biological this and organic this and whatever it is. And one thing, if you've watched some of our videos, you'll have noticed is that here at Mondo Farms, we have a very pragmatic approach to crop protection. There are times when we use organic products like neem sides, neem oils, and recharge. And there are times when we use diclophorus. Diclophorus. The problem with these com chemical compounds is they always have really, really hard names. And I think that one is called Doom. So yeah. There are times when we go soft, sometimes when it's preventative and just you know, a bit of maintenance, and there's times when we need to go down there and do knockdown, because that's what's needed at that particular time. As we continue to face this serious situation and continue looking at the things that we're being advised to do, something else that we've been hearing from the experts in the forecasts and the ministries and stuff is that we should plant early maturing varieties of our crops. Hmm. And some of you may be saying, what does that mean? Let me take a second to quickly talk about it. So all crops have got a certain time that they are planted, that they take to grow, and that you can harvest the fruits from them. Maize cob is a fruit, eh? We all know that even from Nchwala, the tasting of the first fruits. Let me not digress. So these crops, plants, have got times that they're in the field. Some crops are what we call early maturing, some are medium maturing, and some are late maturing. And some might be like, let's say 90 to 100 days, and 20 days to 150 days. And the reason why there's so many different types of um, maturity in, in commercial crops is because of different climates and weather situations. Example, there are parts of Zambia that have got a lot of rain for a very long rain season. For example, Northwestern and Kumie Sukuluapula. Okay? There you'll have 150, 160 days of rain. If you were to plant an early maturing variety, let's say of maize or soya beans or something there, and then it was ready, the maize cobs were ready, you then couldn't harvest it when the maize cobs were ready because it's still raining, so the cobs can't dry down and you can go in the fields to get them. 
Vice versa, if you are in a place that has a very short, dry um, rainy season and you planted an, a late maturing crop, imagine it would still be requiring X amount of days of rainfall for it to be ready by the time your rainfall had already ended. So we always try and time and match whether you're in region one, region 2A, 2B or region three, the type of, of crops that we should be planting for that reason, it's very important. So this season, because of the short rain season that we're having in these regions, most parts of Zambia, we're being advised to plant early maturing varieties, which will be able to come out of the ground and be ready for harvest faster. The rain season won't be very much, so if we have a short crop, then all the better for us. Yes, I understand that most um, early maturing varieties do not have the same yields as the late maturing varieties. But the situation is where it is and we have to take action. I'll use a football analogy. My favorite football team, it's called Arsenal Football Club. Years ago, we were the champions of UK, your English Premier League every other year or so. And we were in the Champions League final and semi-finals and all of that. And then we fell on hard times. We ended up having to every year qualify for something they call the Europa League. But we as Arsenal fans who love to see our club, we got used to it. We got used to Thursday night football. We got used to our club going to obscure European towns and cities that we had never heard of and playing against opposition that frankly was not up to the levels that we believed that the greatest team in the world should be playing against. But during those years when we were mired in Europa League dome and almost failing to qualify for Europa League, our oh, Wandy, we got used to it. Thankfully, things are much, much better now. And we, uh, yeah, we're doing Champions League things on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Yeah, the Champions! Ti -ti 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 -ti. So we here at Mondo Farms this year are switching to early maturing varieties of soya and maize this season. We bought our maize seed for this season the other day, and these are the varieties. We're also about to get the soya bean seed that will also be early maturing. We're also being advised as we face this difficult rainy season to move away from maize and soya beans. These are the crops that are grown the most, but they also require a healthy amount of water and nutrients, okay? To a certain extent, of course, especially in the case of soya beans. And what we're being advised to do is to grow the more drought tolerant crops like sorghum and millet. Now, sorghum and millet are grown extensively in certain parts of Zambia, especially the much drier areas. So farmers out there this year, more of them are going to be going out there to, to, to source sorghum and millet seed and find out how to grow sorghum and millet seed. We haven't tried it yet, either of those two crops here at Mondo Farms, uh, because we generally find that it takes us a year or two to know a crop. So if we do put down some of our fields with sorghum and millet, it would be on a small scale while we kind of learn and understand how it grows, what the two leaf stage, the three leaf stage looks like, and all of that. It takes us a little bit of time. One other crop that we're being advised to grow uh, a crop that is very popular in the part of Zambia where my late father partly came from Luapula is cassava today. That one is used as a main starch for people in many, many, many countries, but it's not a cereal grain and easy to grow and we would still have to take our time to learn and understand how to grow that crop. So I love that advice, but not this particular year. But the advice is, go out there and try the drought-resistant crops as well. The other important piece of advice we're getting this season is that we should be trying to provide irrigation to our crops during the dry spells. 
Let's quickly define what a dry spell is. It is a period of days in between rainfall events when you don't get any rain. And this could be four days, it could be seven days, 10 days or whatever. I remember the other year, 2021, I think it was, we had rain here at Winterthorn on January 9, and we didn't get rain again until January 29. That was some very difficult times. We had a crop of soya beans down in Riverside for one of the last crops that we had planted, and it was still in its pod filling stage. That's basically when your money is made, when the beans are now growing inside the pods and it really needs water at that stage. We looked at the situation and said, Tizachi Tabwanji. And we quickly came up with the idea of putting some sprinklers down there. And it kind of worked more or less. So the idea of irrigating our crops is something that we're going to try and do this season but it also means that we are going to plant less fields than what we would have normally done all those fields that you saw us opening up this season arena brazil even the fields where we had planted a huge soya bean crop last year like alaska alaska one two four oh it was brilliant up there nah those will be left we will not be planting there and we'll be doing most of our planting of our maize and soya down on the fields that are closer to the river where we'll be able to irrigate so let's talk about irrigation defining irrigation as when crops are being given water through man-made methods and there's lots of methods and methods of doing that we have done a couple of videos here on the mondo farms channel which you should be able to have a look at and see where we give more details about irrigation as you watch those videos you'll see that here at mondo farms we use two main types of irrigation one is drip right irrigation and that one is mostly used on vegetables but for larger areas we use sprinklers by the way here at mondo farms we haven't yet got any center pivots center pivots are expensive technically challenging and expensive and difficult and expensive our farms are still starting out we haven't got to the center pivot stage yet but we will get there. I'm telling you, we will get there someday. A man must have dreams, mustn't one? When we talk about sprinkler systems, we are talking about simple tripod systems like these. And we also have some of these rain guns like these, which are more powerful and they distribute water across a larger area and they require pumps. So that means that we're going to have to invest heavily into our irrigation capacity this season. We're going to need more pumps, we're going to need more pipes, and we're going to need more sprinklers. We're also going to have to look at things like security because it's very, very, very ill-advised, to put it mildly, to leave your costly sprinkler systems out in the fields for an extended piece of time fields that you are not there every day to look at how it goes so we'll have to figure that out there's quite a lot to figure out and the details we don't have them yet all of this came up in the last couple of days when Tyson and I had finished our crop plant planning schedule and then we looked at it's it's a great big spreadsheet that's got like columns for seed seed cost um you know herbicides fertilizers and insecticides and fungicides and all of that we looked at all the fields that we had wanted to plant in looked at this massive cost then realized this wasn't going to work and then we remember the advice that we were getting and then we said let's go for irrigation so as i stand here doing this video we haven't got the details yet so I know some people will rush to the comments and start asking us questions. Which kind of pump did you get? What horsepower and all of that? And these are details that we don't have yet. On top of that, when we get such questions in the comments, we almost always advise people to speak to specialists. There's two reasons for that. Number one is that we're running two farms. 
It's our full-time job. It's why we're here and what we're doing. Most of our efforts are focused on running and developing and growing our two farms and being able to give ourselves a bit of a return. So sometimes, even if we do these YouTube videos that help farmers out there more generally, we, we're not really able to go out and give that level of advice. Number two is from a liability and experience perspective. There are irrigation experts out there that who literally, it's their bread and butter. It's what they do. They, they know about yield rates and heads and all of this stuff. And they will be able to come out to your farm, measure out things and look at slopes and all of that stuff and advise you on which pumps to buy and which pipes to buy and which sprinklers to buy and all of that. And that's their bread and butter. Yes, it might cost a little bit of money for you to get that advice, but sometimes in order to get something out of something, one has to put a little bit of time and effort financial into these things. So that's always our strong advice. So you can plan and plan and plan, and then you ask yourself, but do we have the money to do all of this? The answer is yes, no, maybe. The farms are still in the developmental stage and we're still doing heavy investment into infrastructure and capacity. We've just finished doing some staff housing in order to be able to accommodate more of our teams here on the ground. So, ish, money and investment, it's where we're at and where our mindset is. We were already planning to invest quite a lot into the next big crop for this season. We were going to buy a lot more seed, we were going to buy more fertilizer and more crop protection. We've already put in money into the land clearing that we were showing earlier. So, that is money that we would have lost if we had planted that big crop, we hadn't listened to the advice, and it would have had a bad rainy season and would have had very poor results. So we're kind of in a better position. Always the optimist, I'm telling you, always the optimist. There's nothing you can do. The other positive um, factor about the situation we're in, if you can call it that, is that whatever equipment we're going to invest in will be used on the farms for years to come. We are still using pumps that we bought in 2021 in at the farm right now, two horsepower, three horsepowers, and they're still working. Yeah, okay, they got problems and they have to be fixed every once in a while, but they're still giving us more of a lifetime. And the investment that we make in our irrigation capacity will help us be stronger and stronger for more difficult times to come. As we say, farming is not easy and times like this have happened in the past and they will definitely happen in the future. Speaking of which, the future doesn't look too good in terms of weather situations vis-a-vis -vis climate change. So what we invest in now will make us be able to produce more crops later when we have more of these weather problems when climate change gets worse and worse as it is already doing. Uh-oh, I've just mentioned the two words that always cause a little bit of a controversy, climate change. So here's the deal. If I say the words climate change on the Mondo Farms channel, next thing you know, some climate change denier is in the comments telling me there's no such thing as climate change. Wah, 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 wah. And funny enough, it's usually someone from the, the States. I don't know for whatever reason. This channel is primarily for African farmers and African farmers are already feeling the effects of climate change. It's scientifically facts, proven and everything that the real effects of, of climate change will be here in the continent that has contributed the very least to the causes of man-made climate change. So it's not fair if I don't talk about the reality that the people that I'm primarily talking about face, a reality that we and our children are already looking at, it's happening. So I'm going to talk about climate change from time to time. And I really ask that if you are a hardcore climate denier, um, it's not doing us here in Africa who are feeling the effects of something that we did very little to contribute to. Look at our greenhouse gases. We basically produce any. 
but we are the ones who are going to be feeling the brunt of this thing that has already started. So from time to time, I will mention climate change and I'm going to be brave enough and not have my channel overly affected by the toxic people that want to come in and tell me this and that and tell me what's happening where I'm living and what I'm going through and everything. Okay, back to the irrigation. We're very happy here at Mondo Farms that we've got two relatively large farms on which we can make choices as to which fields we will grow this year and which fields we're not. I understand that some people don't have that kind of capacity. They've got smaller land areas and what they have is what they have and they can't really make a lot of choices. We're also very fortunate as Mondo Farms that we've got quite a little bit of experience in irrigation because of what we do. Throughout the year we grow irrigated things. So whatever is going to come is something that our teams already have some experience of. We already have some equipment. We already have you know, people we kind of know a little bit more about what we're doing rather than learning it from scratch, which is going to be the case for some of you. I understand that some people um, out there may not be in a position to be able to invest in the irrigation systems that are needed in order to get some sort of reasonable crop harvest from this crazy uh, rain season that we're going to have. It really annoys me when I see on some of our WhatsApp groups people giving advice to farmers who are expressing concern and worry and people are just saying, irrigate, 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 where irrigate, irrigate, irrigate. I'm like, where are you going to say? because not everybody can do everything that they're advised to at that time. And I always feel that those people don't have a lot of empathy for people who may be at a different income level, a different experience level, people who are in full-time employment trying to set up and operate their farming enterprises while they're still doing that before they can ever come into farming full-time, if at all possible. So. Those of you out the WhatsApp groups who are out there just telling people, irrigate, irrigate, irrigate him where, and making them feel quite in Bifipua. Ah, wait, please, let's have some empathy. Let's show a higher level of EQ. So we've said that part of our plan for this rainy season is that we are only going to be growing the maize and the soya beans on fields that we can irrigate. So what about all those other humongous fields that we can't irrigate? Things where we just don't have the boreholes or anything up there. We're talking about Alaska, Canada, the new ones, Brazil, Mexico, and Jamaica. Yeah, I think those are the ones. Woo! those fields we just need to leave them be but we can't just sit there doing nothing and just let the weeds grow what we're going to do on those fields is plant leguminous cover crops and in this case we're talking about two options that we, we like to use here on a farm one is velvet beans and the other one is sun hemp and these ones will be watered by whatever rains will come from the heavens. Don't forget, it's not like there will be no rains. It just won't be the good type of rains that are good for um, the field crops that we really need, the food crops. Putting these leguminous cover crops on those fields for this season will give us two main advantages. Number one, as cover crops, they will help us to retain our topsoil. In a rainy season like this, the topsoil issue is very important. I've said it before in several videos, I will always continue to say it. Farmers don't farm the land, they farm the soil. So you can have hectares and hectares and hectares of land, but it is, if it is not good quality land that is good for you know, crop production, then you may as well not have it at all. So here at Mondo Farms, we spend a lot of time and effort into building up our soils, protecting our soils, maintaining our soils. The problem with a rainy season like this is that you'll get a dry spell. The earth becomes hard. Then you get a lot of rain, 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 rain. As I said before, two, three hours worth of rain all coming in 20 to 30 minutes, then it all washes off you lose a lot of your topsoil. So it's important to use cover crops to maintain your topsoil as much as you can. By the way, we're in the Chongwe River Valley here, so most of our land is sloping. So the erosion problem is something that we always face and that we always think about. 
Sun hemp and velvet beans and other leguminous crops that we'll be putting down also are going to give us a second major advantage, which is that leguminous crops will improve the nitrogen content in our soil. Leguminous crops are used all over for rotation. We use them here a lot. I mentioned the green beans earlier, but the sun hemp and the velvet beans will leave a good amount of nitrogen in there. We are very sure, hoping, touch wood, everything, everything, and talk to the ancestors that next year's rainy season will be okay and we'll be able to go back out to Alaska, Canada, Jamaica, etc., to go back and plant. So having the most healthy, good, nitrogen-rich soil out there will be as beneficial to us. Not only that, but a lot of those fields were previously monocropped with maize, which as we all know is a heavy nitrogen feeder. So those fields need as much help as they can get. It's been really tough coming to a situation uh, of acceptance and knowing these are the things that we need to grow. Listening to the advice that we've gotten from the, from the farmers. And it's only really happened, as I said, in the last couple of days. So we're still formulating and making a plan. Normally on the Mondo Farms channel, I like to have a video and show you this is what we did. But the situation is so dire and so urgent that I wanted to push out this video as quickly as possible so that we talk forward rather than talking backwards and be able to help other farmers out there as much as possible. There's a lot to do. Some of it is relatively easy. For example, changing from a medium maturity uh, crop to an early maturing crop, it's quite easy. Tough things also in there, things like putting in more irrigation and figuring out how to water our crops as effectively as possible over an extended period of time, over a long period of time. We know that the plan, we can't take too long in thinking about it. There's something that's a term that's commonly used in management science called Paralysis by analysis. And there's no time for such paralysis by analysis in this case. For example, farmers will watch this and they will be going out there to their pump suppliers looking for X type of pump, this horsepower, that horsepower, this head or whatever it is. And the last thing we want to do is get out there to the pump company and say, oh, we win this type of pump, what, 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 and then be told, oh, we're out of stock. Their container has just left uh, Bangalore or some other ports in, you know, in the Indian Ocean and it will be docking at Dar es Salaam in three weeks time and then he, that kind of thing happens. So we're really going to get out there and get active and get ourselves ready as quickly as possible. There will be certain expenses within the family, within our lives, within the company that we won't be able to do because the situation requires investment and action now and we just need to go out there and get on with it. So we have a tough few months ahead of us. And yes, it's making us all very anxious. But remember what it was like during the COVID-19 pandemic? And we used to say, it is what it is. And I was so proud of the way humanity came together, the scientists, the politicians, and everybody else, especially, of course, the medical professionals that, that took care of us. And we got through that. Facing weather challenges and food security problems like we have now, it's up to us farmers to go out there and produce the food that we need. I'm hoping this video will help farmers and other people in agriculture plan and execute whatever it takes to get as good a harvest as we can next year. Yes, your situation may be different and you may not be able to do all of the things that we've talked about, but at least you know about them. And also, you've got me telling you to be brave and be courageous. When people are facing a tough battle, it's often lost in the mind before they even go there. My favorite team, I'll talk about them again, Arsenal. We used to go to places like the Etihad and think that we had lost. And yes, we used to lose. We used to get wired when we went there. But such days are behind us. So just like that, other farmers will be able to get out there, face the tough weather challenge. We've got 
heavy rain, we've got intermittent rain, we've got dry spells, we've got pest problems, we've got disease pressure, we've got poor yields in general, not to mention the extreme heat. But I'm very confident that we will be able to go out there and do what it takes. I wanted to say a quick word to those of us who've just started farming perhaps and you're on a WhatsApp group for farmers, very excited, and you ask a question once in a while, you get random answers. Now that is not enough for you to develop your farm and realize its potential. You can only get so far on social media. The type of information that is there on these farming WhatsApp groups, you are scattered. You need to be able to develop um, relationships with experts, especially in our field, they are called agronomists. Agronomists, you will find them giving advice at most of the fertilizer companies, the seed companies, and they employ them, the agrochem companies as well, to give out advice and they will be able to help you along. I've often said that Mondo Farms would not be what it has become over the last two and a half years without experts who came out here to our farm talked to us, advised us, told us what we were doing wrong, what we needed to do right, and got us to where we are. Yes, there are channels like this where you can watch, and what we're trying to do here is give you guidance, inspiration, you know? That's what we're doing. We're not teaching you how to farm. You will need to go out there and get up close and personal with agronomists. So sometimes when we get those comments where people are asking us for deep farming advice, we do tell them quite honestly to say, eh, Mwandini, go to an agronomist, look at the situation it is. I can't advise a farmer in an East African country about X, Y, and Z from here where I'm sitting in Chongwe, Lusaka province, Zambia. It is almost impossible, but Closer to that farmer, there is an expert, an agronomist who will be able to give them the right advice for their situation. Speaking of comments, one of the things I never really anticipated when we started this channel back in 2021 was the amount of engagement interaction that I would be having with people from all over the world, from different backgrounds and stuff. We started this channel back then in order to inspire and sort of like guide African farmers, especially Zambian farmers, our own, Bamuine, as we say. But now the channel is being viewed all over the world and I'm really happy to get, you know, that positive reinforcement of people whose lives are being impacted by the things that we share on the channel. On the flip side, there have been some negative comments and I'm learning that not everybody looks at us as Africans in a positive manner. And I haven't had, since I used to live in the UK years ago, I haven't had overt racism thrown at me um, till now and it's been quite interesting. I've had microaggressions uh, thrown at me as well and they're really not necessary. So I do ask again that people making the comments do so looking at the concept of who am I talking to, where I'm at, what is these people's situations. No, of course they don't have combine harvesters and big boom sprayers and stuff. This is an African farm in an African scenario. I also want to thank all of the people who've subscribed to the channel. We're closing on 20,000 subscribers. I remember our first 5,000, our first 10,000, we got to 15,000, and it's kind of like amazing how many people are subscribing and how many people are getting value from what we do. I met some of those people at the field day we had a couple of weeks ago and I was so proud and pleased to hear some of that and see what we're doing for people and we want to continue doing that for people. Subscribing to the channel is easy, you just press the subscribe button and if you press the bell icon then YouTube will tell you when another video comes along, which is usually two, three, sometimes four weeks or so, depending on how busy we are. By the way, we're doing the whole Christmas break thing, so there may not be another video until into the new year. There's other people out there that you want to see this video. They may be guided by it. And the best thing you can do is to share it with them by pressing the share button. 
and then you can then send it to them, share it with them on Facebook or WhatsApp or the other social media channels. If you think this video was worthy of your stamp of approval, then give it a thumbs up. And that really helps us with the algorithm because then YouTube then suggests it to more and more people. My name is Chisha Folotia. It's always a pleasure being with you here on the Mondo Farms channel. Shalenipo. Bye-bye.